Uh, so, without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Stan Tequila. Um, and he is back by very popular demand. Uh, he's been on all our evaluations every year, it says, bring Stan back. So we're very pleased to bring Stan Tequila back. Um, he's a naturalist, wildlife photographer, and writer. Stan is the originator of more than 100 state-specific field guides presenting many species of birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, trees, wildflowers, cacti, busy. Uh, over the past two decades, Stan has traveled the country to photograph and document species for his field guides, uh, nature appreciation books, and wildlife audio CDs. Stan started his career in Minnesota by earning a Bachelor of Science in Natural History from the University of Minnesota and has been an active uh, professional naturalist for more than 20 years. Also well-known columnist and radio personality, his syndicated column appears in over 20 newspapers, and his wildlife program is broadcast over a number of Midwest radio stations. So please give Stan a warm welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Stan. Good morning. How's everyone doing? How's the sound? Working out okay? Good. Fine looking group. I'm, I'm totally impressed and very flattered that you would have me come back. I think this is the third time I've talked to this group and uh, it's always my pleasure, let me tell you that to start out with. Um, I'm a naturalist. I feel like I'm at an AA meeting. Hi, my name's Stan and I'm a naturalist, you know. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Somebody who knows right up here. Um, who here, though, knows what a naturalist is? I mean, you guys must know, right? A naturalist is an educator, an educator about the big world around us, um, whether it be plants, uh, animals, uh, birds, insects, but more importantly, how it all fits together, you know, kind of the big picture of things. And hopefully through my books and these talks and things, I give you some information that you can take and become more informed and... Uh, I'll start out by applauding you for showing up at a conference like this to learn and expand your, your knowledge of, uh, of wildlife. I've been very fortunate to be able to travel around and photograph and write about the things that I absolutely love from the moment I can remember, uh, from the youngest childhood remember, uh, memories of mine. I've always wanted to be uh, a, a wildlife photographer and a naturalist in writing, and I'm getting to actually live my dream right now, so it's pretty nice. But um, wolves are one of the near and dear subjects to me. And I'm, I'm really captured by, by wolves. Uh, an apex predator who, uh, besides man, has to fear nothing and uh, is kind of runs the ecosystems. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to go out and photograph a lot of wild wolves uh, and spent a lot of quality time with wolves and, uh, and, and presented a, a, a book that you're going to be able to see later. And um, oh, there's some of them right here uh, of happening. So with that, I think what we're going to do is we will get started here and start talking about the lives of wolves. You guys got any questions before we get started? You seem pretty quiet this morning. You seem Yes, sir. Or oh, ma'am. Sorry. Oh, yes, please, you guys. Um, my guys up front said that they turn all the lights back down a little bit so we can see the screen a little bit better. What do you think? Or not? <laughs> Guys? What do you think? There we go. Yay! Wonderful. Yeah, sounds like we have a request to turn the house lights down, too. No, you don't want to see me. No, no, no. That's the whole point here. <laughs> turn down the lights. Look at that. Don't look at me. Yeah, you know, and that's, that's the thing is, you know, as a photographer, I like being behind the camera, not in front of the camera. So, big differences there. All right, any other questions before we get started? We're going to have some fun with this. we get got about, about an hour or so, hour and uh, five minutes to go through. Um, wolves are an interesting group of animals. Uh, I'm not sure you can find a more controversial animal right now in Minnesota, too, right? Uh, hopefully you've been following some of those things. Let's, 
let's try to um, uh, hold those questions till the very end because I've been doing a lot of talks about this and inv invariably we always end up talking about the wolf hunt in Minnesota and, we'll, and I'm f I love to talk about it. We just let's hold those to the very end and then uh, we'll get started. So ready to get going? Is ready? Set to go? All right. So really these, there are a few animals that really have that elicit such emotions in people such uh, guttural things in, in people. We look into the eyes of a wolf and we see uh, 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 perhaps ourselves, perhaps uh, we see power, perhaps we see um, uh, uh, just something we may not understand, but yet on the inside we actually do understand. And uh, so for me, when I look at wolves, I, 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 every time I have an encounter with a wild wolf, uh, it, it's a memorable one, and it's one that I can actually physically feel inside because they're, they're, they're really amazing animals. So early humans, of course, uh, uh, knew that these things were top predators, uh, and they're very similar to you and I. They, they live in family units. They hunt together, and they, are, uh, they stay together year-round and are uh, a cohesive unit. They truly are. So... By the way, we're going to have an, uh, this, is going to be, this talk is going to be a combination of kind of information and showing off photography on top of it, too. So, so of course, the Native Americans uh, uh, interacted with wolves a lot. They killed wolves, but they did it in a different way uh, in which uh, uh, kind of uh, representing something. They didn't really fear it or need to obliterate it uh, as, uh, as we have as a, uh, as a culture. They uh, seem to like to uh, co uh, coexist with it, so... Uh, but they're really seen as the masters of the hunting craft, and there's no doubt about that. But uh, it does not come with consequences. It, uh, it is a, for these wolves to hunt, um, it is a very dangerous uh, thing. We're going to get into that a little bit later, but let me remind you the average wolf is you know, 80 to 100 pounds, and the prey that they're going after is usually their size, or depending on what part of the country, quite a bit larger. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, they're formidable uh, when they go out after them. So. Um, <clears throat> so settlement times, of course, began the longest, most sustained uh, kind of uh, persecution of a single species uh, in that they, the U.S. government actually determined that they needed to eliminate this, this animal from the landscape here. So large prey in the wild became scarce due to overhunting uh, from the settlers coming across the United States, and uh, the remaining wolves were forced to switch their diet to livestock and things, which brought them into direct conflict with people. And as you know, anytime you got wildlife and people in conflict, nearly every single case, the, the wildlife loses. So. so the wolves of the 20th century, though, were, were quite interesting. In 1905, the U.S. Congress established a biological uh, survey to eliminate wolves and all other large predators, such as cougars, Bobcats, these things were seen as a bad thing and they were uh, eliminated. All this to uh, protect livestock of a growing nation. And the 1924 federal biologist here, uh, uh, Edward uh, Goldman, declared a large predatory mammal, destructive to livestock and game, no longer has a place in our advancing civilization. So you got the mindset of what these uh, uh, lawmakers at the time were, were doing in the early 1900s here. By 1940, when the wolf was eliminated from nearly all regions, people started to speak out in favor of the wolf, and uh, Aldo Leopold was one of the very first to kind of speak in favor of it. You guys must know Aldo Leopold, I, I assume, right? Uh, he wrote Sand County Almanac. Uh, 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 he was out of Wisconsin. So he was a conservationist, um, a father of wildlife management, and he was the first one to kind of said in 1944, restoring wolves to Yellowstone. 1944. So that's pretty forward thinking, I would say especially in a time in which wolves were seen as vermin, you know, not good at all. And uh, by the way, it wasn't until 50 years after uh, Leopold was saying this that it actually started helping or started happening. By the way, these, these pictures are from Yellowstone. Uh, these are the packs uh, uh, out, out there. I've spent so much time uh, in Yellowstone photographing these wolves. It's uh, amazing. So with the birth of the environmental movement in the 1970s came, you know, came the Endangered Species Act in 1973, as well as all our major environmental laws, such as Clean Water Act, uh, the Clean Air Act, <clears throat> and of course the Endangered Species Act. Um, all very controversial things to this, to this day, which seems a little strange to me, and I'm not going to go political on you, but uh, by the way, 1973 was brought in by a uh, Republican president. Do you know who it was? Yeah, Richard Nixon. Right. So we had a Republican president bringing in the strongest environmental laws that we've ever seen. 
and they remain today. And they are actually the reasons why we have such success. Uh, look, I'm in my uh, early 50s. Uh, I've, I'm old enough to have seen very polluted times uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, bad water, bad air, and I uh, now see that complete reversal. Um, think about it. Bald eagles, loons, ospreys, uh, these are all species who benefited greatly from these uh, legislation and the wolves and who have come back dramatically over time, over the last 25, 30 years. And it's been a, a pleasure to see these animals on a great rebound uh, back to a much, much cleaner environment that we have now than we did even 30 or 40 years ago. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about the wolves in particular. We got the canids here. This, these are, you know, of course, directly related to our dogs. That's where our dogs came from, uh, uh, came from wolves. So um, they're a carnivore, uh, dog-like uh, mammals that include the wolves, the foxes, the coyotes, jackals, and domestic dogs. They're all together in this group here. And the canids can be split into two major groups or tribes, uh, wolf-like and fox. And uh, as we get into this talk, you're going you're gonna to discover that actually wolves and coyotes are very genetically similar to each other, very, very similar. Foxes are like way over here. They're not even close. And uh, you might think that they're very similar to each other, but in fact, they really aren't. So we have the red fox, we have the gray fox, both common here in Minnesota. You guys are familiar with these, with these animals? Uh, and the, of course, the way to tell the difference between the two of them, it's a simple, easy way to tell. Do you know how? The tip of the tail, white tip of the tail on the red fox and a black tip of the tail on the gray fox. They will, both the red and the gray, have great color morphs. They, change, they don't change, but they are born uh, uh, very blonde or very dark. There's all sorts of different color combinations of them. But the consistent factor is that tip of the tail there. And so that's what you've got to look for when you're looking for it. I'm always surprised at how many people don't realize we have uh, more than one species of fox in Minnesota. Now, in the US, we have the swift fox, tiny little fox, adults weighing five pounds, little tiny things this big. Uh, absolutely adorable uh, little creature, creatures. Kit fox, even smaller. This occurs down in the America Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, things like that. And then the Arctic fox. I just returned from the Arctic um, where I was photographing polar bears for a new book on bears. And uh, I was so looking forward to interacting with Arctic foxes, seeing them, photographing them. I was 100 kilometers north of Churchill, Manitoba, and there were no Arctic foxes. They've been all displaced by red foxes who are pushing their way up due to the warming. Very interesting stuff going on there. Island foxes, these are a distinct group of animals on the Catalina Islands off the coast of California. So the origins of this species, they appeared to have started about 60 million years ago. And of course, uh, coyotes appeared about 1 million years ago. And then foxes are unique and are not closely related to the wolves or coyotes. And they, uh, they came around much later. So. Wolves around the world, uh, were, they're very well known. So wolves have been found on every continent except for Antarctica. Uh, they thrive in a wide range of habits, uh, habitats, from mountains to forests to deserts. If you've ever been down in Arizona, it's amazing where you can see these, uh, you know, the Mexican wolves uh, in, a, in an environment which you wouldn't think they, a big, large carnivore would live in, and there they are. So um, they're uh, wholly arctic, meaning that they, go, uh, they once occupied all around the hemisphere at about 30 degrees north uh, latitude. And unfortunately, they were eliminated from 99% of all the regions, save Minnesota and parts of Wisconsin. So we are actually really kind of a, 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 a holdout uh, of, uh, wild, uh, of wildness. So family traits on these animals are pretty straightforward. They got long legs. They're digigrade. You know, what does that mean? Sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? <laughs> a weird word. They walk on their toes. OK? You and I are plantigrade. We walk flat-footed like that. These guys are always on their toes. Uh, Non-retractable claws, dew claws, which are the claws further up their, uh, their foot. And then uh, they're well-furred. They got long, bushy tails. Uh, they got long, pointed muzzles. Those long, pointed muzzles are there for a very specific reason. We're going to talk about that later. It's all for the olfactory system, being able to smell. And then they have strong jaws, probably the strongest jaws in all of the animal kingdom. And then uh, young are born helpless with their eyes closed. So they're all very similar. So compare that to your dog, with the exception of some of those morphological things like the long nose, and they're very, very similar, right? 
So there are subspecies on these things, uh, but uh, let's, not, let's not get into these. I think we can start talking about DNA differences between them and all that. Currently, as many as 40 subspecies, uh, the Arctic wolf, the Mexican wolf, the red wolf, these are all different subspecies of the uh, gray wolf. So the coyote is thought to have about 19 subspecies. 16 occur in the U.S. Who would like to be the scientist who tries to differentiate 16 subspecies of coyote? I mean, don't they all look the same? <laughs> you know, they really do. It's crazy. So ninth, since uh, 2005, uh, foxes have had a, a total of 45 subspecies. And foxes, as you, if you know anything at all about foxes, they're very different in coloring. In one litter, you can have uh, f four different colors. Uh, so foxes are like, they break all the rules all the time. Uh, uh, they're kind of a troublemaker species, if you will. So, um, and let's see. So here's the Mexican wolf. You can see, morphologically speaking, longer legs, thinner body, uh, uh, bigger ears for uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, evaporating off more heat. Uh, and uh, they're a, a very interesting uh, looking, looking animal. By the way, animals who live in the desert are always lighter in color than the animals who live in wetter, uh, more moist environments, too. So the gray wolf is often called, these are popular names here, the timber wolf, lobo, lone wolf, a bunch of different common names. You find these things all over the place. Here's the one that gets me all the time, brush wolf. What the heck's a brush wolf? I don't get it. So I oftentimes hear people uh, saying coyotes are called brush wolves and things like that too. So coyotes are also known as uh, the brush wolf, prairie wolf. Um, and, but if you know anything about these animals, if you've seen, if you've interacted with any coyotes and wolves, I find it difficult to, uh, to confuse the two, but if you haven't, if you don't have a lot of experience with them, then I can see where you'd be a little, uh, little confused with them. The size difference alone between the coyotes and the wolves is remarkable, and so therefore it shouldn't be too hard for you to tell the difference. So size from north to south, uh, gray wolves are the largest members of the canid groups here, and their body size varies across the range. What does this next thing say? Wolves in Alaska and northern Canada are the largest and heaviest. And this follows the Bergman's rule. You guys know about this, right? This is the rule that says, within a species, depending on what latitude you are, the further north latitude you are, the bigger and more body mass you have. And the further south latitude, the smaller and the less body mass. And this all has to do with keeping warm. So look at the white-tailed deer here in Minnesota, where 200 pounds is not unusual. Look at the white-tailed deer in the Florida Keys. They're what? 40 pounds, and they're this big, you know? Tiny little things. And it all has to do with heat. So if, if, and it's all about retaining heat is really more importantly. Because, I mean, is it important to retain heat here in Minnesota? Right. And so the bigger you are, the more, more body mass you have, the more heat you retain and the warmer you stay. So this is your excuse, people, for putting on that extra weight. <laughs> you can just say, I'm following the Bergman rule. Look it up. Because you can be heavier and warmer than in the wintertime. So, of course, when summer comes around, you're in big trouble. But, uh, and the wolves are the same way. Uh, they really are. So the further south, they, de they decrease. The Mexican wolves are the smallest ones here. So size north to south, also in the in the in the foxes and the coyotes. Take a look. Here's a gray fox here in Minnesota. Big, bushy, fluffy. Here's one that I photographed down in Belize in Central America. Uh, look at the difference between them. They're the same species, but uh, because of uh, uh, the Bergman's rule, they're much different in looking and appearance, don't they? So. Weights and measurements on these things. The largest wolves live in Canada and Alaska, of course, 120 pounds. And that is a very large wolf because I hear people tell me, oh my gosh, we saw this wolf. It was huge. It was like 200 pounds. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. It just doesn't have that way. So record was 175 pounds in 1939. So uh, adult wolves in the lower 48 weigh about 80 to 120 pounds because they're, they're a little bit smaller. Again, we're moving south in latitude. And uh, we don't see that. Now, uh, for coyotes, this is kind of where you really start to see the differences here. Coyotes are uh, only one quarter to one half the average size. So about 20 to 40 pounds of, uh, that's not big. You're, I, I'm guessing if you've got a family dog at home, <laughs> it's 20 to 40 pounds easily, right? Uh, and it ain't huge. So um, you often see that. Here's, look at these guys here, the swift, fo or the, excuse me, the swift foxes here, a red fox. Seven to 15 pounds, swift foxes, three to seven pounds. I have a 10-pound dog at home, and he's about that big, <laughs> you know? I just, 
When I was out photographing these guys here, it was just like, you're, you just want to look for that little key in the side of them that winds them up, you know, because they look like a little toy. You know, it's like, they're so cute. You know, look at that little thing. But don't, don't get me wrong, though. They're little, they're canids. They're little hunters. They go out, and, they, and they're, they're fierce when they hunt down a mouse. You know, they're fierce when they catch a, when they catch a little bird, you know, a bobolink or something like that, you know. So it's all in size proportion, so. Males are, uh, males are typically larger than females, uh, but there are exceptions to this rule. Uh, of course, like in our raptors, the, the birds of prey, the hawks, owls, and eagles, uh, the females are larger than the males, but in the mammals, it's almost always with the males are bigger than the females. So, what do you think of that picture? This is up, uh, I'm just going to... If you don't mind, I'll do a little commentary on the photos. Um, this is up uh, near the Boundary Waters, and I'm up in an airplane, and uh, we're circling above the uh, wolf as it's walking across a lake. And this just, to, it's in February, shows the big, long shadows, those blue shadows of our northern latitudes. We get that blue shadow uh, here in Minnesota and points further north. F south, you don't get those blue shadows like that. It's really kind of a neat little thing. So I was out uh, uh, with a pilot, and... Um, He's, uh, we're, we're finding these wolves, and I flip open the window, it's February, it's below zero, and the sun's just come up, and I'm photographing out the window. Of course, I cannot stick the lens out the window, because if I do, you know, you're doing 110 miles per hour, you know, the buffeting of the, you know, the wind hitting your lens goes like this, so you have to kind of get back in, and of course, you have to sit this direction, because you're flying that way, and the airplane's on an angle like this, because the pilot's doing circles around on his wingtip. He's just flying around and I'm trying to shoot out the window photographing down on him and honestly about the fifth, sixth, seventh spin around there I'm like where's the vomit bag? You know, it's like holy mackerel. It's like the worst you know carnival ride you can possibly imagine. So at any rate, uh, so the dynamics of these packs puts a lot of pressures on these leaders which means the alphas don't live as long as some of the ones who never achieve the alpha status. Uh, so uh, wolves in the wild live about four to six years as, as the alphas. They really, it's not very long. In captivity, wolves can live upwards of 20 years. But they're constantly being challenged within their pack. They're constantly having to be out front. They're doing the major part of the hunting. As I mentioned before, hunting is very dangerous with these animals. They're, 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 they're literally dealing with animals in many cases who are uh, multiples of their own weight. And it's difficult for them to, uh, to do it without getting... I was out in Yellowstone one time when uh, a pack, the silver pack, uh, was going after a, uh, a, a small um, a female bison in the snow. And that bison got one kick off in the back leg and caught the uh, alpha female of this pack right in the head. And within an hour's time, she was dead. Uh, I mean, it's very dangerous. You're talking about an animal who weighs over 1,000 pounds that they're trying to take down out there. It's... It, it is really a, a tricky business for these guys. So, disease, rabies, canine distemper, uh, parvovirus, all these things take a lot of toll on these animals. And I've got many pictures of, uh, of wolves with mange. And uh, when they have mange, it is, uh, it's a sad, sad case because they're missing usually the hair in the back half of, them, of themselves. And um, uh, they, in the winter time, Mange in the wintertime is very hard on these animals. They cannot lay down in the snow. They have to sleep standing up. They have to stand 24 hours a day. If they lay down, they'll actually freeze to the snow. With the fur, it gives them that insulation, and they have no problems with it. But the mange causes all the fur to fall out. They get direct skin to ice contact, and they freeze to it, and it is, uh, it's a death wish for them. So. Uh, parasites, heartworms, uh, mites, which is the mange, uh, really takes a toll on these animals. So car collisions, of course, shooting, trapping, poisoning, and now hunting seasons. So uh, life expectancy on these wolves here is, uh, is not... So life expectancy, we talk about that. But here, how would you like to... Think of it this way, folks. How if, as a job hazard for you, you had to deal with grizzly bears? Okay? Because <laughs> what happened here was this is an alpha female who killed this mule deer. And as she was trying to feed... A grizzly came in. She has no choice here. She has, she, there's no match there at all. This is an occupational hazard for this wolf. And it's like, you've got to get it down, and you've got to start eating as fast as you can before a grizzly bear comes along and steals it from you. That's pretty tough. It really is. Those are the realities that these, these animals are really facing on a regular basis. So life expectancy of coyotes, five to six years in captivity. They can go up to about uh, 20. And then, of course, the average red fox lives only three to four years. 
swift foxes two to four years, and then the oldest foxes the, uh, survive in the wild have been 12 years. It seems like a pretty brief life when you look around the room and you see small children here who are just starting out at 12. So hunting to survive. This is my reminder to you that wolves hunt to survive. They don't hunt for fun. They don't hunt for sport. They don't hunt for, oh gosh, what am I doing on Saturday afternoon? Let's go hunting. They hunt to survive. They hunt because they have to eat. They don't eat, they don't live, they don't, you know, and they can't reproduce. And so it's a simple fact, and it's, it seems odd that I must have to tell you that, but in my uh, experiences that uh, there's, a, there's a notion that these animals like to go around killing things just for fun, and it's simply not true. So the fact that the wolves are just trying to survive from day to day is what it's up. So without killing, they go hungry, and uh, that's the simple facts there. For these animals, each kill is a matter of life and death, and it's their own life that matters. So, the, yes, are they, are they uh, uh, kind of rough, uh, ruthless, and um, uh, kind of, I don't know what you'd want to call it, aggressive? Yeah, absolutely. If they didn't, they wouldn't survive. And that's the laws of nature. That's all there is to it. So, um, Wolves need habitat. They need, adult, they need abundant prey. Uh, they need uh, free movement, uh, uninhibited by, uh, by uh, basically by people, and there are good reason for the wolves to hunt in packs. And the reason for that is that one wolf is hardly a match for even one deer, let alone a moose, or a bison, or elk, or caribou, or whatever it is that they may be hunting. So it is a uh, uh, the reason why they hunt in packs. It's not efficient to hunt in packs, by the way, because. It takes four of you to take down one animal. That means you only get a quarter of what you could have gotten if you were taking the thing down by its, you know, the prey down by itself. So, in fact, really, hunting in packs is not a very efficient way of doing it when you look at it from the wolves' perspective. When you look at it from the survival perspective, can you survive? Uh, but, you know, can you get enough to eat to survive? Is the is the bottom line there too? So. They feed on much larger prey, so hunting uh, with others is very, very necessary. And the disadvantage of cooperative hunting, the larger the pack, the less each wolf eats. So I, I just got an email. You guys must get these emails, too. I get these emails. They're sent around to a million people, and they're vilifying this, or they're vilifying that, or they're saying something ridiculous about this, or something ridiculous about that. And I got one recently about a wolf pack with 25 wolves in it. How horrible they must be. They must be killing everything. Really? <laughs> Because that, that's a, it's a tough goal for them at 25. Uh, that means they're not getting a whole lot to eat whenever they, get, whenever they do get anything uh, captured. So, Guiding the pack is always done by the alphas. And um, so the dominant alpha male is usually the one. But in some, and I've had uh, personal experiences with uh, alpha females who were the dominant leaders of the packs. So it's not a uh, hard, fast rule that it's the males that are always in charge. It's not. Uh, sometimes the females are in charge. It all depends on the individual personalities of those, uh, of those wolves. And, uh, and they do have individual personalities. I, I hope I don't have to remind you, too, that I mean, these animals are very, very uh, uh, different from each other. They're not all pre-programmed, uh, very predictable wind-up toys. They're, they're, they're unique individuals, each and every one of them. So uh, only the leaders uh, breed in the pack. And um, uh, here in coyotes, uh, here's, a, here's a classic example of coyotes. Can you tell which one's the male and which one's the female? Of course, we know that this is the male. I mean, he never uses a napkin, right? He's just kind of a... <laughs> and they are... It, apparently, he also thinks that this impresses the girls, which never works, by the way. So, but so then with coyotes, finding a mate is very uh, uh, interesting. By the way, they're breeding right now. February is the month for breeding of coyotes and uh, foxes and wolves all around the United States and uh, around the world, actually. So, uh, territories, I, by the way, I love this picture here. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is the Lamar Canyon pack. Do you guys follow wolf issues at all? Does anybody here follow any of the wolf issues? Yellowstone stuff? No? Okay. Uh, this is, uh, I'll just give you a quick brief breakdown. Um, this right there, that is the alpha female. She's in charge of this pack. There's actually two or three missing out of this pack. They're off in another location. And um, uh, th this is a pack that was uh, uh, probably one of the most uh, uh, photographed, um, uh, kind of sought after packs by all tourists who went to Yellowstone to see these animals. Uh, this was the kind of like the iconic pack for the last three to five years. And um, 
Uh, you can be, if you went to Lamar Valley, your, your, your chances of seeing these wolves. Anybody been out to Lamar here recently? Uh, did you see the wolves there at all? No? You're, on, you're on bears? Okay. I don't blame you, man. Bears are awesome. <laughs> I'm just finishing up a book on bears. It's been, it's been great. Yeah. Exactly. So this was the pack that was there, and I talk about them in the past tense because November 7th, she, the alpha female, was shot, and the uh, uh, alpha male was shot also right outside the park boundaries. They uh, went out of the park boundaries and were shot by hunters legally uh, uh, there just on the early part of November. So, so wolves are extremely territorial. We, that's, that shouldn't be any uh, surprise to anybody. The size of the territory depends upon the food. Uh, sources. So a lot of food in their area, they need a smaller area. But the more scarce the food, the bigger area they need to cover to scrounge up that food, right? Makes perfect sense there. So usually rivers, cliffs, mountains, other geographical landmarks serves as these natural boundaries. So if you've got a river, it happens to work out that those things often are the river boundary or are the boundaries for a lot of these territories. So uh, coyotes are very similar to like, uh, like this, uh, that they have sm but they have smaller prey. So they don't need big, vast territories. Because they're going after, you know, what are they going after? Mice, voles, shrews, rabbits, uh, pheasants, things like that. Uh, they're not really, oftentimes, their major prey is not deer. Um, uh, they, they do take them, but they don't, uh, it's not their major uh, source of uh, food. So the average territory for a coyote uh, packs are from 2 square miles to uh, 15 and 20 square miles. So smaller, much, much, much smaller. And then foxes, of course, are, much even, are even smaller than that. Uh, so their uh, swift foxes, are, they can have tiny little territories with these swift foxes, these small animals too. So roaming the home range, they stop often, they scent mark uh, on prominent structures. Anybody who owns a dog knows all about this, right? You're out walking your dog and what are they doing, you know? <laughs> checking the mail and leaving the mail, right? They're coming up, they're sniffing a post and checking the mail and then they're peeing and they move on. And the same thing with wolves here too. So the following the prey around in the winter, can you guys see this? herd of elk here in the wolf pack there. Um, what they do is they'll, uh, they, they follow them around. By the way, this is called a vigil where the, it's a standoff. The snow is so deep, except for on this ridge where the wind blows it off. The snow off of that ridge is very deep. That means the wolves can't run and the elk can't run. And we're at a standoff here. The elk are all together. They're kind of, of you know, as a, as a herd, if you will. And the wolves are like, we can't do anything because they certainly can't just waltz right in the middle of these elk because the elk will just kick them literally to death. And so the wolves kind of hang out and they wait and the elk wait and they wait and they wait. I sat there for about five hours watching this and eventually what happened was the wolves laid down and started going to sleep. And then one by one, the elk turned and in single file, they went like this. <laughs> and they're looking over their shoulders going, <laughs> Come on, you know, and, they, and off they went, and, uh, and the snow was very deep, right to the, the bellies on these elk, and so they can't run real fast in there, and so they, they got the heck out of there, too, so. Scent marking is something, uh, this is an interesting, I'll just tell you a little bit about this picture here. This is the, the canyon pack in Yellowstone. This is the alpha male in the canyon pack. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be out uh, trying to photograph these when uh, me and another photographer were standing there, and we looked, and I was like, holy mackerel. Down from the mountain, here comes the whole entire pack right at us. And so we're standing there thinking, wow, <laughs> what an opportunity. And we're photographing, and the alpha female walks up, and she walks right by from about here to about the middle row, you people. She walks right by, stops, turns, she turns sideways, she looks at me like that. I'm, of course, taking pictures like mad. And then she walks off. The alpha male comes down, this guy right here, <clears throat> comes in about from me to, I don't know, about the middle row over here, stops, looks at me. Pees, walks over there, pees, walks over there, pees, there, <laughs> there, all the way around me, came back to the beginning, right where he was, this is the last picture I took, he looks at me, he pees, and you can just read his mind, he's basically going, okay, pal, inside that circle is yours, everything outside is mine, <laughs> and then off he went, you know. Look, when you have experiences like that, personal experience with the wolves, it changes you. You're like, wow, that was something. It really was. You're not sitting at home watching PBS when this happens. You're standing there, and it's pretty amazing. So, uh, they, so they, they, they designate uh, territories. They, uh, they convey all sorts of things with their, with their uh, scent marking, sexual readiness, age, uh, who they are, all sorts of different things come from uh, that 
And we, as people, I don't believe we can understand this. I believe that this is beyond our comprehension. Their ability to smell, their olfactory system is amazing. And they're going to catch all of those things, all of these uh, signals, these notes, uh, within a scent. Honestly, that'd be like walking up to somebody, maybe from me to Joe, and just go and know that Joe is, you know, married, kids, whatever, you know, think anything, and know all this about them simply by smelling them. I don't think that you and I have that capability to even conceive what that's about, because that's very unusual for us. Um, and so uh, they, they also see things very differently, too. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. But scent marking is very important to these things. So the, the scent is carried in the urine. It's also carried in the feces. And so uh, uh, they scratch the ground. You've seen your dog do this, right? They scratch the ground here. They've got, they got uh, little um, glands in their feet, in the pads of their feet, that help uh, that kind of um, uh, spread uh, a scent on the ground. Another f source of communication with these uh, with these animals, too. And there you can see the feces of these, uh, of these wolves. So scent marking. With coyotes are basically the same thing. Both wolves and coyotes leave, they leave twice as many markings along their territory edges as they do in the inside of their territories, for obvious reasons. You'd think that, right? So studies show that a scent mark can remain active, constantly advertising the intentions of the wolves for two to three weeks, okay, if there's no uh, uh, rain or heavy dew. That's a long time. Uh, and I've always learned from all my, my wolf researcher, biologist friends, who say things like, uh, a wolf can walk through, and just the scent that they put down, other wolves can tell who walked by and how long ago they walked by, too. And that's, that's would you like to have that ability? Wouldn't that be something? Or would that be a burden? You know what I mean? I mean, because maybe you go, oh, yeah, that'd be great, that'd be awesome. But then again, maybe it's not. <laughs> you know? Maybe it's just too much information. Uh, for you, so. So, howling to communicate. All right. So howling is mostly associated with loneliness, but it is totally incorrect. They are not lonely when they're howling. In fact, howling, uh, uh, well, howling peaks during the breeding season, so right now is the time. And um, that you should be out listening for your wolves if you live up in northern Minnesota or get a chance to go out. Now, let's get see if we can make this work. A little audio clip here. Keep your fingers crossed, folks. Ugh. I'm going to say that's going to be a no. Ooh. No, that was not me. <clears throat> that is a sound when you're out in the wilderness and you hear really raises the hairs in the back of your neck. It is truly a sound of the wilderness. It's truly a sound that uh, indicates that you know, you're in a kind of an interesting area. So in forested regions where visibility is low, howling can carry up to about six miles. Out in the big air, open areas, howling is going to go as far as 10 miles. And this is a way for them to communicate in between each member of the pack. They don't really communicate from pack to pack with um, uh, howling at all. This is usually within the pack, all right? So howling to communicate here. Let's see. When the wolves howl back and forth, it's almost always a member of the same pack answering other pack members, all right? So they know each other, and they know the sounds, and they talk to each other that way, too. So howling to announce the possession of a territory is almost never answered by the, by the neighboring packs. Okay, and then howling serves to bring the pack together after separation. So this is where they have a rendezvous site. That rendezvous site is where they've predetermined this is where we'll meet, and then they howl and everybody comes into that area. So howling with the coyotes. Let's listen to this one here. You're going to hear a big difference between the uh, wolves and the coyotes. <laughs> So the wolves are a single note, long, drawn out, low. These guys, yip, 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 high pitched, you know. Look at the size difference between them. Very, very different between them. Um, uh, uh, hopefully you should be able to tell the difference uh, yourself with these guys here. 
Um, much, much different than the wolves. So, in the same way that scent marking and howling communicate, so does facial expressions. What's this guy saying to you? You know? I mean, look at that. He, he's clearly looking <laughs> and thinking something, don't you think? There's a thought process going on there. So, here is the happy dog, you know? Hi, I'm Happy Wolf, you know? Here's the, I'm not so happy. <laughs> You touch my food again, I'm going to take off your leg, is basically what he's saying right there, you know. You don't want to mess with them. So, tail language, this is something that's been reported upon over and over again. I think it's a little overrated because the tail language really doesn't, if you ever really studied these wolves, uh, when you start, you know, you always hear about the you know, tail up, tail medium, tail down, and all that. They actually, the tails are all over the place with these animals. You really have to watch it and know exactly what you're talking about in order to interpret these, with these tail uh, postures, a dominance and things happen. There's a lot of conflict that goes on within these wolf packs. It is not an easy life for these animals at all. How would you like to be on the kind of the receiving end of that? Huh? So, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure why this picture is in here. Uh, do you guys know the, the, do you see the wolf dead here in the tail, in the tailgate of that truck? Um, this was the alpha female from the, um, the druid pack in Yellowstone. Druids were the very first iconic pack in Yellowstone. Uh, they were up to 35 members at one time. Uh, they were the ones who were kind of uh, the, the pack for Yellowstone for a very, very long time, up until about five years ago, when uh, the Druids died out. Uh, she had terrible mange. Was, I was there the day that this all happened, and I photographed the whole thing. She uh, uh, had, uh, the pack was falling apart. They were down to about four members. Uh, mange, parvo, Starvation was getting to them very badly, and as a last desperation move, she uh, took her pack, brought it over to steal some food from a neighboring pack because they weren't able to get their own food, and she suffered a, 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 a kind of a rip in her throat as she fought with the, elf, with the alpha female of the other pack. The two of them fought. They retreated, came back to their territory, um, stood and watched her as this was mid-February. It was below zero. Uh, she had mange, so she couldn't lay down. The sun was setting. Uh, I was standing there photographing her. She was wobbling, literally standing there wobbling. And the sun was going down. It was, very, it was getting to be very, very dark. And we all stood there. I was there with the, with the biologists. And um, uh, we, so we were all just like, you know, what are you going to do? So we all agree, agreed back here at daybreak. And uh, we all went back, <clears throat> came back in the morning, and there she was laying there dead. She didn't even make the night. And that was the end of the Druid Pack in Yellowstone. From that day then, the Lamar Canyon Pack started um, with uh, two members of the Druids and another outside female, and those were the ones who kind of been running the valley for the last five years, the ones that everyone's been going out to see, the ones that have been so good, but also are the ones who were shot last November. So if you were planning on making a trip out there to see them, they're not there, unfortunately. So. Conflict is a big deal within, uh, within the pack things, and, and, and certainly that's the result right there. She died as a result of a conflict wolf to wolf. So Conflict in coyotes are the same way. Conflict in, in foxes are the same way. Foxes tend to avoid each other, but uh, they do encounter each other, and they do boxing matches. You ever see this when the foxes, they get up, and they box with each other? Uh, wolves don't do that, <laughs> and they just go at each other pretty hard. Scent rolling, so uh, how are we doing on time here, folks? Oh, we're doing good, right? Uh, um, so maybe the odor makes the, it, it's really strange. Have you seen your dog do this? They roll and they just find the most foul smelling thing you can possibly imagine and then they roll in it. It's like, what's up with that, you know? I mean, can you get, on, you know, can you get more repulsive, <laughs> you know? And, and, and there's really no good reason for it. We don't really know, uh, but it may uh, serve to attract a, a female. I don't know, what do you think? Would, you think that would work on you, gals? <laughs> you have blood all over you and you stink to high heaven. <laughs> I don't know. Seems kind of strange. Look, for that reason alone, you know, if, uh, you know, having blood all over you and you smell funny is an attractant, how are you and I supposed to understand the lives of these animals if, if it's polar opposite of what you and I know, right? So it's very interesting here. So maybe the odor, uh, uh, you know, like I said, attracts the females too. So wolf and coyote hybrids. There's a, there's a lot of talk about the wolf and coyote hybrid, and we're looking into this a lot right now. And we are finding that in some areas, we ha there are some wolf coyote hybrids. In particular, in the uh, kind of the northeastern Great Lakes, Ontario area has uh, has this. And um, 
where, uh, and the, the theory is this, that what happened was is the wolves were uh, diminished in numbers so far down that when February came around and it was the breeding season, because remember, they only breed one time a year. They got about a two-week window of time in which they're going to breed, and that's it. It's not like your dog who can breed at any time, okay? And so uh, you can imagine this. There's very few other wolves around. You're a wolf looking to be, uh, you know, uh, to mate, <laughs> and there's nobody around except for this lonely coyote. And this is the theory on how this interbreeding happened, because normally what happens is that the wolves chase down and kill coyotes. I have a great experience with that. Uh, and uh, that's the normal interaction between them. So chances are that's how it started. And we don't see a lot of that interbreeding now that the populations have come back up again. So some interesting stuff going on there. So uh, there's body form, the morphological stuff, the DNA evidence that suggests that wolf populations have bred with coyotes in the past. So in southeastern Ontario, uh, southern Quebec, and parts of the United States bordering these provinces where coyotes look suspicious. I've seen these photos. I've not seen the animals myself, but I've seen photos of these coyotes, and they look a lot like wolves. So something's going on in that region that's very unusual. So. Uh, wolves in Alaska and the West are 100% wolf with no DNA evidence of hybridization at all, probably because they've had a, a significant population size. And then so in the uh, Western Great Lakes, the genetic makeup is about 85 to 90% wolf and about 10 to 15% coyote. So here in Minnesota, we have this slight overtones of coyote inbreeding with the wolves. So red wolves in the North Carolina, only about 24% wolf, about 76% coyote. Very interesting stuff there. So and there's a, a, no indication of any wolf-fox hybridization. And the reason why, genetically speaking, coyotes and wolves are like 99.8% genetically the same. And with, coyote, with foxes, they're only like 60 or 70% sharing genetics. That's not a lot at all. So beginning in late summer, early fall, canids start to grow dense under fur. Uh, here, and they add up to one-third of their total fur, just getting ready for winter time. Now, this here picture is a coastal wolf. I photographed this wolf up in British Columbia. These wolves live on small islands, and they swim a lot, and they make a living on salmon. Have you ever tried feeding salmon to your dog? My dogs hate fish. And yet, these guys make a living on it. I actually followed this guy for quite a while. He went to a stream and actually caught a salmon. And, and, and brought it to shore and ate it. Uh, consequently, they live longer, too, because of that healthy diet. <laughs> they're swimming, they're eating fish, you know. It's like, we can learn something from that, right? So, but, so you can see the, how it changes. Summer and winter coats here. This is, by the way, this is very important. They, they, they have to take care of their feet because their feet you know, are, are getting a lot of ice pellets in there, a lot of problems, and they're constantly cleaning their feet in the wintertime. So, uh, they do gray with age, just like people do. Very interesting stuff there. So you get them starting out young, uh, brown or black, and then they gray as they get older. So wolves have such, a, uh, uh, excuse me, wolves have as much as 1,500 pounds of pressure per square inch. I literally have, in the situation like this, where they're eating that deer carcass, I've crawled up on my belly with a camera to photograph them, and I was from me to you away from these wolves eating this deer. And I could hear them biting completely through rib bones and then chewing them up and swallowing them. Go home and try that for dinner tonight, folks. <laughs> Seriously, we don't think about the, what's going on with these animals. They actually need to eat these bones to gain the calcium and things from it, too. It is truly remarkable. And of course, consequently, <laughs> when you see their scat, it's like, wow, really? That went all the way through you? <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to do that, <laughs> you know? So they have skulls that are designed specifically for this. Do you see this right there? That is actually a flat projection called a keel on the back of the skull that all those muscles attach to. In order to get that immense force to bite and crush, they have to have muscle attachment in a big, wide area, if they had just a small little muscle attachment, they'd have weak little muscles. But the more muscles, the more attachments that they need. And we see it here in their skulls. When you look at other animal skulls, like bears, for example, black bears, 
they have very little keel, if all, at all, because really they're not eating a lot. They're eating grass, you know. They're not crushing through bones like the wolves are. So these are highly specialized animals. Excellent sense of smell. So canids have a sense of smell 100 times more acute than us. 100 times more. Look, I, f I travel a lot internationally. And uh, just recently, coming back from the Arctic, I'm w I walk down a hallway, and there's, a, and there's a, a, an officer holding a dog. And all you have to do is walk past, and the dog's got you figured out. Do you have drugs or not? You're just walking by. And that dog is just standing there. And if they smell the drugs, they sit down. Can you imagine? What is it like to live in a world where you can smell that much? I think we as people, we try to, um, we try to put our human emotions, our, our thoughts, our experiences onto wildlife. How? How can we do that when these animals can smell things as you walk by? It, 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 to me, it's a total disconnect. There's no comparison. How can we say, what is it like for an animal to live when we can't even understand the things that they can do? So a wolf nose has five times more surface area than any adult human. That's that long snout we were talking about, right? So they have acute hearing. So after smell, hearing is the next most important sense for these animals, and they utilize it. They can't even see their prey. But yet, they pounce and they get it. And that is amazing, because they can hear it. They pinpoint in with that hearing. Can you hear a mouse under snow? I can't. It seems amazing that they can do this type of stuff. Coyotes do it. Foxes do it. Wolves do it. They all do it. So. Um, the sighted field, they all have eyes in the front of their heads. They all have excellent eyesight, OK? So all wolves, coyotes, foxes, lack the centrally focusing dot. Do you know about this? Basically, look, you and I, in the backs of our eyes, we have a, uh, it's called the fovea centralis. It's a center spot that's densely packed with rods and cones that allows us to focus greatly on that one spot. And that's how we see things sharply. And we can, like, look at something very specific. The canids don't have this. Conversely, the raptors have two of them in the backs of their eyes, and that's why owls are going like this all the time, right? Because they're moving it from one fovea to the next fovea so they can get a real good focus on what's going on. These guys don't have it at all. And so what they're doing is they're using like a splatter vision. They see everything, not just one thing. They see everything. You and I are more tunnel vision-like, and these guys see that's how they can see movement in any direction, too. So their eyes are positioned towards the front of their heads, giving them three-dimensional stereoscopic vision with 180 degrees view. So strong, long legs. Look how long those legs are there, too. So they lope. They can cover a lot of ground. Believe me, I've tried to keep up with some of these wolves when I'm trying to photograph them. And I'm, look, I'm having chest pains trying to keep up with these guys. And they're just trotting along, like, wherever. You know, no big deal. So of course, they have four legs. I only have two. So. Big paws. Yeah, that's a human hand. So look at the size of those paws. Absolutely huge. So that's what they look like there. You get an idea. That's an adult male hand. So the diet on these things, of course, wolves spend about one third of their life hunting and eating. And studies show that an average adult wolf eats at least 15 to 18 deer per year. Now we get to do some math. All right. In Minnesota, which has approximately 3,000 wolves, this amounts to about 45,000 to 54,000 deer per year taken by wolves. All right? Automobiles kill the equivalent number of deer every year, and hunters take five times as much. That's interesting, don't you think? Wolves take the weak, the sick, the young. They don't take the trophies. And vehicle collisions kill more deer indiscriminately, regardless of health or age. I can't tell you. Now, a day goes by when somebody tells me, we don't have any deer anymore because of all those damn wolves. Really? You want more deer? Get rid of the cars. Seriously. I mean, then, you know, it's going to be a whole lot more. But when, you know, when we're taking five times as many hunters, are taking five times as many wolves 
or de uh, deer as the wolves, it's hard to make an argument here. Hunters tend to take bucks and uh, the breeding females, of course, and the, and the wolves are taken, of course, the, the smaller, the younger, the weaker. So diet and coyotes are the same way. The main diet for coyotes and foxes are small mammals, voles, mice, but they will also scavenge anything that they can find. So coyotes are masters at finding food like this, too. So they catch, they eat rabbits, hares, chipmunks, woodchucks, so on and so forth. So mice, things like that. You get a good example of all those things. So. Wolves go for three to four days without eating, so they'll feed, they'll feed, they'll feed, and then they lay down, <laughs> and they'll digest for about three to four days. Not a bad little life, huh? You know, you go out, you risk your life, you know, you kill something, you eat like a wolf, and that's where the expression, you know, wolfing it down comes from, and then you lay around for three or four days. Well, after a kill, they'll gorge themselves, consuming up to 18 pounds of meat. Wolves are also known for the ability to eat rotten flesh. And this is something we don't quite understand. I have a friend who's actually doing research on this, where wolves can actually eat rotten flesh, something that would cause you and I to be very ill. They can eat it and have no problems with it. Talk about adapted very well, right? How are we doing on time here? We have about 15 minutes? Am I good? Where are we? Anybody? All right, keep going. Traditions in courtship. So courtship in wolves starts about two months uh, before the breeding season. So they're going to start back in November, December. And then courtship in wolves. Oh, let's see. Well, you can kind of see what's going on here. This is what's happening, getting ready for, uh, for breeding time. The, here's the adult female. Here she's in estrus, ready for breeding. And she will actually go and uh, solicit copulations from her, from her mate. So wolves breed only once per year, unlike dogs. Males become a receptive acting uh, back in October and November. Typical guy, breeding season doesn't start till February. The guy's ready to go in, in October, you know? <laughs> it's like, let's go, right? So female's receptivity uh, to mating only lasts 8 to 18 days. So she's kind of like, she's holding the keys to this, and she's saying, all right, this is when we need to breed. And, and not until then, because they need to get this, uh, this done right. Because they miss that window, no kids that year. No kids, no new pack members. No new pack members, it's tough to survive out there, right? Aren't they cute? Come on, really? So wolves don't make homes in their dens. They use them only for eight to nine weeks following the birthing of their pups, and then they leave the den and they don't come back. It's not like you and me, we go home in the same home every night. These guys don't. They, they, they use their den, once they're done with the den, out they go, and they sleep outside, okay? They don't, they, don't, they don't need protection from elements. They sleep in the snow, the wind, cold, night, day, whatever, right? Females choose the den sites. That sounds about familiar, right? Always choosing their women, are always choosing the houses, so. And the females do most of the uh, uh, caregiving for these, uh, these animals. Same thing with the foxes, same things with the coyotes, very similar. Uh, to uh, what's going on here. So breeding and gestation. So breeding season, we, we talked about that. We talked about this. All right, moving on. Aren't they adorable? Swift foxes, aren't they something? These, are, these guys, these are puppies. Their adults are five pounds. These are the puppies. They're like three pounds. They're like this big. They're little tiny little things. They're just adorable and fun and happy. Yeah, that is the Badlands. Let me back up. And these are uh, swift foxes. So they're being reintroduced in a lot of different areas. They were wiped out from the central parts of Nebraska, South Dakota, Colorado. They were wiped out there. And then they're, they're doing successful rebreeding and letting them go into the wild. And I have a friend of mine who's a biologist out there. And I actually got to hold one of these animals one time. It was truly amazing. Uh, I mean, little tiny things like that. <laughs> so litter success. So the average litter size for the adult female uh, pup is about uh, six, and then coyotes, four to six, and swift foxes, eight. The smaller they are, the more they got to reproduce because they don't live as long too, right? And red uh, and gray foxes up to 10. So average litter size. So this is a cute little thing here. This is, this is remote camera work. I've got a remote camera in place so that I'm not there. I'm not disturbing them. I have the remote camera. It's hidden, and it's going off. And the foxes can't see the camera, but they can hear it. So they're like, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you know? And they and look at them. They're just so cute, aren't they? So, and coyotes produce four to six pups. Well, we talked about this here, too. So, OK. Birth and development, 12 to 14 days. The eyes uh, appear light blue. And then they can't see anything. So it's just like any kind of uh, other animal here. 
and four to five weeks, the animals are, uh, the eyes get darker and they start to see better. And here's their play toys, <laughs> things like that, right? Here's a wing of a pheasant that uh, learning to hunt. Uh, they, they practice, they you know, pounce on things all the time. So at about three months of age, the pups are uh, following their parents for short excursions and then they go out hunting afterwards. So dispersal from the pack, this is a big topic. How are we doing on time here? Lights are coming up, I'm assuming. We've got about uh, 10 minutes here. Dispersal depends upon uh, the age and uh, the, uh, something I said? <laughs> <laughs> so dispersal depends on a lot of things. So a lot of times, uh, if they're born into a pack, they, they'll stay there for two, three years, and then they'll disperse out uh, to other packs. Some, some pack members never leave the pack. They stay within their pack all the time. It all depends on that individual personality that we were talking about before. So uh, the temperament, basically, of the pack, personalities of the youngsters. All these things play into who stays in the pack and who doesn't. It's kind of like your own family. Think about your own family that way, too. So uh, let's see. What do we got here? Basically the same thing for all these animals. Finding mates is not, never easy. Sometimes they get together and they find mates. Sometimes uh, they uh, disperse other uh, uh, alphas. They'll move into a pack and kind of take over. And so this is a very complicated uh, t uh, topic that I'm not gonna really going to get into. But they have, you, need for, you need new territories. You need sufficient food. You know, other wolves there, things like that. And uh, they can also kill and usurp other wolves. And so with that, I'll say thanks for uh, listening. Now we can bring up some lights, and I have a few questions then, too, if you like. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, will a coyote or wolf uh, uh, prey on family pets? Absolutely, without a doubt. They will taunt them. They will draw them out of your yard. They will do, they're very smart animals, and they will, I've seen and heard many times of coyotes coming up to a yard and, um, and draw out the uh, a, a family pet, and then the other ones come in for a kill. There are many cats, domestic cats that are taken this way, and many dogs that are taken this way too. So, very common. Questions? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. What kind of protects your lifespan? <laughs> just, just sheer stupidity. <laughs> Dumb luck, that's all. You do, you, do, you do strange things as a wildlife photographer. I don't know if you guys know, I'm just finishing up a book on bears, and last winter I had an opportunity to crawl into a couple different bear dens. <sighs> Look, folks, I do this for you. <laughs> <laughs> so that you can have those experiences. I enjoy it, actually. I, I, I really do. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned before you were talking about mixing and mixing your species down. Yep, yep. How you noticed that there was some change culturally in our attitude towards conservation. Have you noticed yourself in your travels in talking to people, and being a radio personality, have you noticed that there has been a shift from the conservative party no longer valuing conservation? And what can be done to either rebuild those values yeah. Yeah, you guys heard that. Did you, could, could you hear her? Do I need to repeat it at all? Um, look, all I'm going to say is it's ironic that our major environmental laws came in under a Republican administration. They were essential. They were important. Uh, and now they are the bane of many of in the Republican Party. I don't understand why. I'm a biologist. I'm not a politician. I don't really care about politics. Um, the, but it, I do find it ironic that we would, things would change. My father was a lifelong Republican and uh, interesting conservationist, uh, uh, wildlife man. And uh, he really supported that. And I don't think if he was alive today, I don't think he'd be in approval of, what's, of what is happening. So, but it's hard to say. Yes, sir. Well, they're, it's good that we're listening to this because um, the sounds can be very deceiving. 
because they carry long, long ways. When you hear them, they sound like they're right there, when in fact they're like half a mile or a mile away. Because these things are going to carry five to six miles. So um, you know it when you hear it, how close they are. And the carries are very similar, but they're yippy, 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 you know? And you should be able to, after listening to a few times, be able to say to yourself, okay, I got that. Coyotes are much more uh, yip, yip, uh, high-pitched. Wolves are much more of that low, mournful, single note type of stuff. So, yes, sir. Right. Uh, a bunch of little yiping in one spot. Right. I, I was under the impression, or it might have been Caius, but because he's a bull, so forth, but uh, that it was a young bunch of little wolves in a pack. No. With their babies, and all of a sudden they're yiping. Yeah. And all of a sudden, boom, silence. Yeah, no, I would disagree. I would say the yipping, he's saying he lives up near Bemidji, hears these things right after dark, and you're hearing high pitch. That's coyote. Right. And what happens is, is that they spent the entire day sleeping. All day long, sleep, 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 sleep. It starts getting dark, time to go. Wake up, stretch, relax, what's going on? Let's get ready to go out hunting for the night. And they call the rest of the pack. And they come together, and as soon as they get together, it's all that face licking. You know how you see dogs do this, the tail wagging, they're licking each other's faces, and they yip, 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 yip. Oh, isn't this great? We get the whole gang together. Let's go to work. We gotta go find something to eat. We're gonna starve. We gotta go. And that's what's happening. So they're getting together. They're not young wolves. Young wolves sound like adult wolves. Yes, sir. Will coyote and uh, fox share a range? Sure. Yeah, they all actually will interact and share within a range, but they hate each other and they will try to kill each other all the time. So wolves will try to kill the coyotes. Coyotes will try to kill the foxes, and down, and down, red foxes will go after the arctic foxes, and all the way down the down the line. And it's really a, a, a matter of size. So, uh, and, it's, and it's not a matter of food in those cases. They're eliminating competition, literally. Yes, ma'am. No, they're fine. Um, the wolves in Yellowstone were reintroduced in the, early, in the mid 1990s. 80 some wolves were reintroduced. They were come. They were came from uh, a variety of wolves in Canada. Canada has and Alaska has a lot of wolves, and so the genetic diversity is fine. It's not like a whooping crane where we had this genetic bottleneck uh, of, of black-footed ferrets, where we were down to 15 animals total, six males, seven females, like that, and that's it. You know, uh, it's not like that. Wolves are really genetically diverse. And more importantly, when, when, when wolves disperse, we didn't get a chance to talk about it, they dispersed for 100 miles. So that really mixes up the genetics on it. It's really very, very good. So all the way in there in the back. You, yes, sorry, sorry. Um, how do both of the um, The hybrids of wolf coyotes? Yeah. They sound more wolf-like. By the way, if you guys are thinking about these wolf-dog hybrids, don't do it. I got a friend who does a rescue for wolf dogs, and they are dangerous animals that you, that you don't want as a family pet. Go ahead. So there are over 400 wolves in the whole species? Yeah, 413. What kind of effect do you think that's going to have on the question The question was, there are over 400 wolves killed in Minnesota during the hunting season this year. What kind of effect that's going to happen? And look, uh, you know, I'm not anti-hunting. Let me make that perfectly clear. I work for Outdoor News. I'm pro-hunting. I'm pro-fishing. I'm all for it. But we're hunting a predator species that, in the natural scheme of things, is not normally hunted. That's unusual. That's un they're an apex predator who uh, does the hunting, is not hunted. They live in complex social family units. We don't know who we're taking out when we take out a wolf. We don't know if we're taking out the aunt, the uncle, the alpha male, the alpha female. We don't know. And I've seen it time and time again. When one individual is removed from a pack, the pack dynamics change like that, oftentimes resulting in the pack disbanding and all of them going in separate directions. So have we now just created wolves who are like now going to be interacting with people more and more and more? because now they're like, whoa, off on their own, and now we got lone wolves who are trying to figure out what's going on. We don't know. We don't know this, this answer. Uh, there, there's a good chance of it, uh, but we don't know what, what that answer is. I, I personally 
Um, I, I'm just, I'm not a fan of predator hunting. Wolves are there in an ecosystem to maintain balance. They eat too much, they starve to death and die. <laughs> you know, that's all there is to it. That's just how balance in nature works. And without it, you got problems. So, am I running out of time? Okay, one more minute. One more question. Go ahead. Right, right. People go out and howl for them. They'll come over to you. And oftentimes they come in so close that you can't, that you don't see them. But they come over and they check you out to see who you are, get a visual on you, and then they go back. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic there that I don't know anybody has a good explanation for that. It's kind of like they want to see who you are because you represent a potential threat. So they come over to look at you. That's what their main thing to do. So, that they have a I mean within the pack they have the the, the 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 call that gets them all the rendezvous site that all calls them all together. They have those, yeah. And but it's it's so different. I mean, you and I, we it sounds all the same to us, but they have all the, the you know they can hear all the, the differences in it. So, all right, go ahead, a couple more, yeah. I don't, no, I don't. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to capture natural behavior, so I'm using lenses this long and trying to stay back and do it. In those one cases where you're mentioning about getting up close on them, that was an opportunity that I had, and I took advantage of that opportunity to get close and be able to photograph them, and it was well worth, worth, well worth the time and effort. So, oh my gosh, you guys, go ahead. How about if we keep going until they throw us out of here? <laughs> go ahead. Wolf encounter? I've never had a dangerous wolf encounter ever. Uh, wolves, in my experience, have had no interest in me. Uh, they, are, they fear people. Every wolf I've ever encountered has feared me, has not wanted to come near me. In fact, has gone like this, kind of like, you know. I had a very interesting situation. Uh, I, let me tell you a quick story. While out in Yellowstone photographing wolves, there was a bison kill. A coyote came in to feed on the uh, bison. And um, the wolves were, had left. The coyote was there. And um, the wolves came back down the valley, down the river valley, and did a sneak attack and came up right on this kill with the coyote. Caught the coyote red-handed on their kill. As Soon as the coyote saw him, first thing he did was he laid down in the snow. And then he thought, uh-uh, they got me. He jumped up. That coyote did not run this way. He did not run that way. He turned and he ran straight at us. There was four of us standing there, right here. They were running. The coyote ran straight at us and ran behind us. And from about here to where that screen was, went behind us and curled up and laid down with his tail like this. <laughs> and you might have seen that picture of five wolves running in a straight line, running right at us. That's what I was photographing as those wolves were running straight at me. And those wolves came up. That coyote was using us as protection. <laughs> Those wolves ran in circles around us, trying, and they were like looking at that coyote and then looking at us and going, I'm gonna get you. We're, get, you know, just get away from those people. And they ran around and round and round, and they were they wanted that coyote bad. The coyote got up, came over to our side. All the wolves came over here, they're thinking, Yeah, yeah, come on, come on, come on, bring it up. You know? And the coyote's over there, and then all of a sudden the coyote just poof, took off that way, right past us, got on the road and started running as fast as he could, leaving all those wolves over there going, grr, grr, you know? <laughs> but those wolves did not come anywhere near us. They were, and they knew, and that coyote used us specifically for protection. It was one of the most thrilling wildlife moments I've ever had in nearly 30 years. It was amazing. It truly was. So, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, they're, they're more in northwestern Minnesota. They'll come, they come as far south as Hinkley, uh, kind of in, in that region. Uh, the further west you go and into the prairie, the fewer wo wolves we have. So they're more of that northeastern uh, section there. So is John not around to throw us out of here? What's going on? Can we go? Let's wrap it up here, okay? All right, guys. <laughs>